Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Too Many Men podcast. All cats all the time apparently are about to be, we'll see. Um, but we are so happy to have, I don't know, we should be honored. We've got a star of NHL.com live streams hanging with people like Pierre Maguire. I don't even know what she does to put up with us two. Sarah Sivian, Sarah, how are you? Oh, yeah, that was fun last night. If anyone wants to check it out on the NHL YouTube stream. Um, just watched the hurricanes get destroyed in a heartbreaking way on national YouTube, whatever you want to call that. <laughs> well, Sarah might, might be in a little bit of sadness. She's got a uh, stories of how Matthew Kachuk is ruining her life. We'll get to that. Um, but we would be nothing if we didn't have, and folks, we're going to just lead into a segment that Shana has wanted for a long time. Our wrestling correspondent extraordinaire, Shayna Goldman. Shayna, say hi. Hi. So in honor of Shayna, Sarah, before we get into the actual hockey that happened since we last talked with our listeners, uh, it's time for our favorite segment by you. What time is it? Bit O News. Bit O News. Shayna, I'm not even going to introduce this bit of news. I'm giving you the floor. Please tell us the most important bit of news coming out of non-ice activities <laughs> from the NHL. I know you were really excited for this one. I'd like to point out that the What's person, that you you were hyped. You pointed this out to me. You're like, mm -hmm. I love wrestling now. This is my new favorite thing. None but of this is true. It's all true. Um, you were the one that sent me the Kyle Davis picture with the WWE belt as well. So, you know. The people need to know that you care. I care about you. Unlike when you, you're trying with Taylor Swift, I will try. Doesn't mean okay. I like it. Okay. I have a full outfit idea for you. And I, I, I'm so excited for this. All right. I have done my research on. We have like two weeks. It's, That's it's not enough. It's, it's fine. It's fine. The first, well, you have two shows. Oh, Sarah, I think Sarah's correct. Oh, so I don't get it for one of them. No, you're getting it for one, but we might add to it for the other. I'm oh thinking boy. a snake belt, and it's a very cute idea. It's going to be like a not belt. the bit of news. Oh, God. <laughs> this is important stuff. I'm caring about Taylor Swift for you. Okay, the bit of news and more important news is that Bruce Boudreau went to WWE when it was in Hershey, Pennsylvania, which we knew he was going to do because he's besties with Kevin Owens, and he actually cut a promo and was front row, and we got to see him throughout WWE wrestling the other night, and it was super cool, and we love Bruce Boudreau, who's a big wrestling fan. We love the support. I think he made the connection with Kevin Owens because of Jackie Redman. We love that for him, and it's just like a wonderful thing. Sarah, do you have any comment on this bit of news? Yeah, it's wonderful to see Jackie Redman also works in wrestling and hockey and just like the Bruce Boudreaux storyline she found when he was working at NHL Network with her for a minute. And then she got to surprise him with Kevin Owens. I just think that's amazing. And he seems like such a delight. He, he does got a promo. He was so good. So cute. He does seem like a delight. And we are happy to see Bruce, Bruce Boudreaux happy. So there you go, Shayna. Biddle news. How does this affect the WW whatever? I don't even know. Anyway, here we are. Okay, Shayna, now you get to introduce a segment. What we, honest to God, here we are, Shayna. What time is it? It's time for How Does It Affect the Leafs? The segment that just keeps on giving. <laughs> the segment that, that keeps on giving. And we're going to start to somewhat cross into our hockey talk as well, my friends. But here we go. Last night, the Carolina Hurricanes were swept. We'll get into the actual on-ice hockey. But as reported by Mark Lazarus, and we're going to discuss this more in depth too, so let's hold the actual discussion of the point to later. But Mark Lazarus uh, reporting that Rod Brindamore, after the series is over, says... That's the unfortunate part of this. People are going to look back and everyone's going to say you got swept. That's not what happened. I watched the game. I'm there. I'm cutting the tape. We're in the game. It could have been four games the other way. To which, pseudo friend of the pod, he just hasn't been on yet and he won't have us on his pod yet. And that's like one of my, I keep reminding him he should. Steve Dangle quote tweets this of Leafs fandom extraordinaire and says, not to make this about the Leafs, but if Sheldon Keefe said this, we'd never hear the end of it. People would call in sick because they were up till dawn making memes. TVA would have a one hour panel discussion that would just be four people saying three to four French words between crying laughter. Sarah, you were the one that brought this up last night, that it all still comes back to the Leafs. 
juxtapose what Rod Brindamore said versus, to Steve's point, what would have happened if the head coach of the Maple Leafs had said this after going out 4-1 in their series against Florida. And he wasn't the only one. Dom Lushigin, friend of the pod, also said, just imagining the reaction if anyone on the Leafs said this, as if we aren't already talking about this all day. We talked about it all night. There's been memes about it all day. So I don't understand what else would happen in Leafs world. I think no matter what anybody says coming out of the Leafs, it's going to have that reaction. And what Rod Brindamore said is having that reaction in the hockey world anyway. Like, you're not special. Shana, did you think it would have been any different if if Sheldon Keefe would have said this? Yeah, I think it would have been (laughs) different because I think that there just would have been more hot takes. I think, I don't want to say like more of us respect Rod Brindamore because that's not the right way, but I feel like. How does this affect Rod Brindamore's bid to the Hall of Fame? (laughs) Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Like, I just feel like when it, when it surrounds the Leafs, the controversy is there as a baseline, right? Like our bar for the Leafs controversy is so low that when actually something does happen, it skyrockets to a point where like, we can't, there's, there's too much discourse to handle. Even Cohen is, I don't know if you can hear it. Kona is freaking (laughs) out when I, when I said this, because she knows that she's screaming about this, that I mentioned the Leafs, but like, I think that with any coach, it's going to be like at a certain level of controversy, but the Leafs, because they're starting here and they're starting very high, it just goes through the roof. We're nonstop talking about it. Now we're writing 10,000 word stories about it. And the live retelling of this moment is happening <laughs> five years later. Like we're all going like off the wall because it's about the Leafs. So I think that there is a difference and it's not because of the coaches themselves. It's because of us and everybody reacting to it. So Sarah, let me ask you this, because you've covered small market and larger market teams. It, it as a de- dedicated reporter, you could argue this to Shana's point is that do we think that Carolina did just quote unquote get beat or are we not holding an organization as accountable as maybe we should? Like, are the Leafs trying to teach us something or is Carolina trying to teach us something in the, the Leafs narrative? The Leafs are teaching us something. <laughs> I think whenever I like to read between the lines with Rod, because I know he is so grateful for ownership and Tom Dundon, but I think he wanted an acquisition at the trade deadline. So when he says we were right there, he's trying to scream, hello, I would like one more piece to be fully there, but we're all interpret. He was also just pissed and he has so much passion and these games were close. Like he has, has anybody they were, they were, misspoken they were. in there? Does anybody have has passion? What, Does anybody know the passion? The passion, Rod's version, but he <laughs> is just like he upset after this, obviously, because all also the Hurricanes have been swept in three consecutive Eastern Conference finals that they've went to. So it's just kind of the narrative lives on. And how does that affect the Leafs? I don't know. The Leafs don't go to the Eastern Conference. <laughs> yeah, we'll never know. They don't make it that far. They finally <laughs> made it past round one and look what happened to them. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> No, I mean, but do you see what I'm saying? I mean, Shana, do you have a thought? Because like, I even think of a team I used to cover like Columbus, right? And they haven't had resounding success either. Should they be getting more heat like the Leafs or are we too hard on the Leafs? The Leafs like make their own bed to a point. So, you know, like, Maybe if they privately celebrated with their Bud Lights after round one, this is a different conversation with the Leafs. I'm not done here. I'm not finished with this storyline yet. I I think that the Leafs are like, they just make it worse. And sometimes it's not the team itself, it's the fans, but I think the players and the whole vibe around them, like it just makes it worse for themselves. I think a, t- a team like the Hurricanes does deserve heat to a point that they knew the injuries at the deadline. And like you said, they wanted a play. You brought in Jesse Puyarvi, who's great and wonderful at generating shots, but not finishing his chances. That's your big problem. Like, not that there were a million options and they did try to go for someone like Timo Meyer, and we know that, but they failed. Like, to have other options, if they, if we, there were reports out that they tried literally everything and didn't get that kind of player, I think it's a different conversation versus like, did they think that they'd be fine? I don't know. Like, it's a little bit tough. But this year, I, cut them a little more slack because of the injuries. Like we know they have a million injuries and they have been 
managing through rounds that some of us didn't think they'd get through to this point. I know now they start to get healthy and you wonder if it's starting to weigh on them, but I don't know. I think that they de deserve some sort of shit for not capitalizing on the moment sooner. We've had them as contenders for years and now you're going to start to ask the questions about like the core and the aging and everything else. And you know, what do they do next to make this team different and build on the foundation that they have? But I don't know. I feel like anything that gets to this point deserves some sort of flack if they're a contender for so long you can't get past it but if you can't get past round three versus not getting past round one there's a difference 100 percent. fair fair all right so let's get into the actual hockey then my friends uh we waited to record until thursday morning because we did want to be able to mark what we feared might be the moment depending on which side of the coin you fall on but the florida panthers in incredible form come back to Florida win both of their games. They have swept Carolina now. As Sarah pointed out, this is the third straight round three in which Carolina has not been able to get a win. It is fair to debate Rod Brindamore's point that this series was very close. If you look at this entire series, the two teams were tied or separated by just one goal for all but two minutes and 40 seconds. And remember the series had that quadruple overtime game. So that is even more impressive. But if we look at this game, Carolina is able to come back, tie the game after losing arguably one of their best defenders after his first shift with a big, big hit that looked really bad. They come back, tie it 2-2. They then come back, tie it 3-3. It looks like this game is going to go to overtime once again. And then with 4.3 seconds left, in incredibly dynamic form, who else but Matthew Kachuk gets the game and series winner, his third of this series. He has had an incredible playoff and series. Sergei Bobrovsky has had an incredible playoff and series. Before we dig into the nuts and bolts of each team and of this game, just Shana, can you can you react to what this series means to the Florida Panthers and just how impressed are you by what this team did specifically in round three? Yeah, I think this is, this means so much to this team and like, you can see it. Like that's the thing we talk about teams like celebrating after certain rounds, like they know the moment that they're in and you can see the way they're embracing it. Fuck your superstitions, the way they take the trophy and they're like, we, we got here and you could see how proud they are every step of the way. I think that's the thing. Like, this is a huge deal that they are in the Stanley Cup final after almost not making the postseason. And I don't think that's lost on them. If Pittsburgh won a game or two, they're not here. So they're showing one, get to the playoffs, see what can happen. Two, don't forget who they were last year either. The President's Trophy team, a contender in every which way, which I think you have to try to like combine the two. But it's like, a refreshed squad in a way that is just embracing the challenges that they're facing and, and thriving. They're thriving under pressure. I think the, the, the turning point you see with Kachuk in the locker room after the Boston series, during the Boston series saying like, we'll be back here. The series isn't over yet from there, just riding this wave and enjoying every part of it that I like, I'm, I can't not have a good time watching their games. I can't like not appreciate this because just how you see how much this means to all of them. I just think it's it's such a moment and they're just taking it and owning it. And Sarah, we talk about, you know, different size market teams. Florida is a market that often gets a lot of crap put on it because of maybe how many people come to games or a lot of different things having to do with that organization. It can actually be a rare thing to clinch a series, let alone clinch an invite to the Stanley Cup final at home in front of your home Fans, I think that's one of the luxuries that those of us who have been able to travel as part of media have is that we get to experience the moments no matter where the game is, but often home fans are watching on TV for some of the biggest moments. Just again, what was your takeaway in terms of how huge this was? We saw all our friends from Levitard celebrating and enjoying the moment last night too. What was your takeaway on how cool this was for Florida to do this in Sunrise specifically? Yeah, our producer, Jeremy Taché, who's there, tweeted this is an all-time moment in NHL history. And then he tweeted, I'm from Florida. I don't know, which I thought was <laughs> hilarious. But I do think it has to rank somewhere. That was fucking awesome. 4.3 seconds left right after the Hurricanes had tied it up. And the best part or the worst part is you knew he was going to do it. 
just based on everything he has been doing. I did not think that was going to overtime, to be honest. I knew Ooh. once he got around there, Sam Bennett starts fucking around around the crease. I'm like, this is bad news. Something horrible is going to happen or something <laughs> awesome, depending what side you're on. And oh my God, imagine being there. That That is exactly what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the conference finals. It's actually good that there are small market teams or new markets or non-traditional markets, whatever you want to call them. These are le- like new fans that are in these buildings that are watching that moment and they're going to be chasing the high of playoff hockey ever since that's how you start you start them young and then you get miserable fans 30 years down the line but we will not go 30 years down the line yet i just think matthew kachuk is great for hockey and great for that market so let's go into this. And to your point, <clears throat> Sarah, this is now, if I if my math is correct, the fourth straight year, a team from Florida will be going to the Stanley Cup final. So that's another commentary on markets being able to sustain some excitement and some enjoyment. Here's my question to you both first, because let's have some fun with this. Sergei Bobrovsky now has 19 goals saved above expected in the playoffs. It's the third highest for a playoff goalie since modern stats were started in 2008 and we've already talked about the greatness that has been Matthew Kachuk the joy of this if you can only have one which one would you take and why Shayna Kachuk or Bobrovsky Kachuk. Kachuk. star power okay he, okay he is a game changer he's a consistent game changer he's good defensively he's elite offensively he has great hands and tight he's a good passer he's a great shooter he comes up big in the big moments consistently last year we saw it in the playoffs this year all in the regular season he can drive his own line he is I think every single thing you want a player because he has the bite and the grit that people want he has the you know he's good defensively and then that elite offensive skill and just the gutsiness to pull off these plays and keep rising to the occasion he is who I want every day of the week Rusky's great and wonderful. I'm thrilled for him to have this run. I, I love that he's proving us wrong. And it's something none of us saw coming, right? Like for him to be the difference maker, especially behind that defense that we know from the regular season, even though they've tightened up in the postseason. Like there's a lot of question marks going to the playoffs because of it. I don't, every day of the week, he's not putting up that performance. He's not putting up that performance in other postseason runs. There's too much baggage there versus Kachuk, who I know is going to come in and be the difference maker. I think you can outscore your problems more than you can just save them away. Anyway, as someone who grew up watching the Rangers and Henrik Lundqvist standing on his head, and it didn't fucking matter because he didn't have offensive support. Sarah, what's your pick? Bobrovsky or Kachuk? Allison, I've realized lately I don't always answer your questions, and I'm going to do that again. I think I think... It just goes to show you need both of them to win in this league. You need the hot goalie, but you also need the star power to score on the other end. All these teams are just so good these days. And I think it goes to show, I mean, you see the devils as an example, like they just, they had the five on five play. They had everything up front and then they just could not get it done because of the goaltending. And you saw how much the hurricanes scored on them. And then you saw how little the hurricanes scored on the Panthers and the Panthers needed that and Kachuk to get this far. Okay. So we all like Kachuk. Are we omitting the secret weapon Kachuk? How important was it that Keith Kachuk called out his son's team and said that they were soft going back to March? Anyone have a thought on that? So, my friends brought this up last night to me. They were like, what do you think of this? And why aren't we talking about it? I think there's something to it. I'm sure it's embarrassing, not just for your teammate's dad, but someone who is a player. But I think the bigger thing, because they still got their asses kicked a couple games after that. I think the bigger thing, and maybe he was fueled by his dad a bit to stand up in the locker room and give that speech and fucking rally the troops of a team. Keep in mind, he was not there last year. This is not like, someone who's been there for 10 years doing this is a newcomer to your team being the one to like round everyone up and be like we are fucking doing this I wonder if his dad doing that is what kind of pushed him to be the different you know be that vocal leader in the locker room a little bit more so I'm giving more credit to Matthew in this instance than his dad only because too like his dad basically ruined his playoff run last year that I don't want to give him all the credit in the world. His dad's the reason Brady didn't get to party last year. It's the reason the flames lost. We all know it that I'm like, are you trying to make up for that a little bit? It's possible. Sarah, do you have a take on Keith Kachuk's influence? Just just Keith- dad, you don't let me party anymore. <laughs> Brady's <laughs> grounded. Covering Bud Lights in my pocket. And, <laughs> 
Oh, get, hold on. Go, you go first. I have another thought. I have a question. Oh, I just think the Ch Kachuk family is my first family of American hockey, and it's amazing to see. And I love that it's not stuffy and boring whatsoever. I also want to say that about K Brady and Matt and Keith. They're just keeping it interesting and they're invigorating this fun in the sport. And I love that for them and us. And I love the support you see. Like you can literally go on Instagram too and see it. It's not just them supporting the NHL brothers. Their sister Taryn is a field hockey player. And I think in Virginia, she's really good in winning championships. And you see like her winning and there's a picture of her on her brother's shoulders. Like I think their mom probably has a lot to do with it. Like we support everybody. And if you don't do it, like you're dead she's the boss it definitely seems like she's driving the boat of everybody there but I love the vibes but what do you think of people now complaining that Brady's supporting his brother keep in mind last year in the postseason when he supported Matthew they were different conferences and he would just wear like the Rat King shirt this year very neutral clothing they're with his entire family having a blast but now they're in division people are whining like he shouldn't be what is he doing wrong supporting his brother? He's not wearing Panthers gear. He's not rooting for the Panthers. It seems like he's solely rooting for his brother to have a good time and to thrive. Why Why is there discourse? Even if he was wearing Panthers gear, yep, I exactly. just wouldn't care. Like, grow up and get over it. What do you want him to do? Sit in a sleep deprivation tank, a sense deprivation tank, or just sleep like sleeping you beauty? You borrow Aaron Rodgers' gear <laughs> and go sit in the corner somewhere. Now, like, yeah, like, if Ottawa's playing, like, okay, like, obviously he couldn't be there, but, like, if you don't want him there supporting his brother, have his team get into and be playing. Like yes. this is this is a family situation. I have zero issue with it at all. Like that doesn't even cross my mind, honestly. Also, look at the games they play each other. There's no love lost. They will kick the shit out of each other For in a sure. game. They do not care. That's like I think that even adds to it. It's the same. Like maybe if we saw the Stahl brothers partying for each other, or the Sutter brothers partying for each other. Not on back, Sunday, though. Never on Sunday. <laughs> nothing too colorful either we can't <laughs> all right so let, let's talk a little bit though too about um, some of the specifics of this game and this series and Sarah I want your take on this first because you know Shana already mentioned too that maybe Carolina wasn't as aggressive as they had hoped to be you mentioned Rod maybe wanting an additional piece there they weren't as aggressive at the deadline and then down the stretch this was something that the three of us talked about going even into this series is that Carolina was so bruised and battered and kind of banged up already. And even though they get Toivo back, you know, they lose Slavin on first play of his first play of the game. And then Nason does not come back to the game either. They had to finish that game with 16 skaters. We did talk about last episode, the issue of rotating goaltenders. Was that a good thing? Was that a bad thing? How much did you see Carolina in, and we are giving full marks to Florida. Florida played a tremendous series and ha is having a tremendous postseason. But how much did you see Carolina impacted by maybe some of the losses and injuries that their lineup did take? It was everything in this round. I mean, you saw all these situations where I thought, man, they could really use Andre Svechnikov right now. And I know you also think about the trade deadline and all the teams that made these big moves and they didn't pan out. But then we're looking at this in a vacuum, I think. Like, I don't think the Rangers needed some old guy with a broken hip. I think the Hurricanes do need a finisher and they always have needed a finisher and they could have got one maybe in the off season and they did. And then he got injured. So you have to look at these things in a case by case situation. And I, I don't know. They go I, I for think... the wrong type of finish every time. Yeah. But I'm bunch. <laughs> Too many fins and Eddie Elcha <laughs> hates them all. Sorry. I cannot, I cannot with that. Like, so, like, if we're having this conversation about a player, like, say Tom Wilson's in the playoffs, right? And you're just, I don't care how clean of a game he's playing, you're harping on. But, like, Sebastian Ajo is so innocent. It's hilarious. It was actually comical. Just whatever. We will not have to yeah, delve into this uh -huh. further, but no. a little so let's, biased. Okay. Let's, <laughs> let's go into something else here, too, that... uh and look, we've talked about this impacting the postseason quite a bit. And we've talked about the fact that it is mathematically proven that as the postseason goes on, that power play opportunities are going to become less and that the opportunity to convert may also become less. But this game four had some really interesting scenarios. There was the non-goaltender interference that doesn't get called. And then, of course, there was a power play that sets up the game-winning goal. I 
wasn't overly convinced that that was goaltender interference. I'm not going to lie, but I saw other people really, really strongly believing in that. And there was, you know, some other impressions and thoughts on some of the other calls and non-calls and in severity of calls, if you will, I'm thinking even, well, the, the Slavin hit wasn't really, that was, that to my opinion was a clean hit, but did we think that officiating was in line with where it should have been specifically in game four and on this series, Shana? No, it's never in line with where it should be is the problem. It was officiating was inconsistent, which is consistent with everything else. <laughs> yes, Therefore, yes. it's fine is yes. if you want if we want to have a sick twisted way. And even that goalie interference call, I literally could not tell you if it's right or wrong anymore because we're not seeing it called consistently. And there are some that are like every day of the week, it's this. But when if it was called every day of the week that way, there's the conversation. It's not. We have no baseline for goalie interference. We don't understand it. The rule's too vague. The officiating's too vague. Everything's wrong with it that I literally can't look at it and be like, it should have been X or Y. Like, it's not that clear because we it even if we go by the rules, it doesn't fucking matter because it might not be upheld that way any other day of the week. And I, it just, I think it applies to everything. The last game, I think it was the last game, there was a little bit more iffy uh, officiating. Like that was a little bit more noticeable for me. I understand when you're facing elimination, like to call to, to call the penalty at the end of the game. I didn't think we were going to see that happen. We know penalties trend down in the later minutes of games. We know that they trend down as series go on. And we know that, teams with bad power plays tend to get more penalties of the power play opportunities anyway, because there's less of a chance that they'll score. And it's just all sick and twisted, but it doesn't matter because logic does not apply to officiating ever because who among us wants consistency. Sarah, (laughs) it's interesting because Carolina and Florida actually had the exact same number of power play opportunities in the series, each side getting. That's why they called it. That's why Mm -hmm. they called it for evenness. You, I'm going to put you in timeout. You keep interrupting Sarah when I'm going to about to ask her a question. I'm sorry. 14 opportunities for each side, but Florida converts on 10. Carolina converts on only, excuse me, did I get that wrong? I did get that wrong. Florida converts on four. Carolina converts on two. Did you think that the power play was a part of Carolina not being able to move forward? And do you agree or disagree with the officiating specifically as you saw it in game four? I don't think it wasn't a factor. That's the problem. You can go back and beat yourself up for 17 things that happened in this series. And it's why the Panthers are succeeding because they are clicking on literally every single cylinder. Cylinder? Is that what it's called? (laughs) Like, hello, good morning. Cylinder. Good morning, everybody. Um, Yeah, so I... The power play has always been an issue for the Hurricanes since Rod was an assistant coach doing it his way. And... I've asked him about it so many times and it just comes down to the personnel, honestly, like, okay, they need a a skilled shooter and Natchez kind of dried up. Everybody dried up during this, obviously, but Natchez was one that's expected to perform on the power play, if nothing else. And he didn't, I I would have liked to see him elevate the puck way more. It just felt like he was taking these shots that were straight into the goalie's chest. And I don't know. It was just, I think officiating was somewhat fair throughout the series, but then game four, it just got a little iffy because the stakes were higher. I think that just happens. But obviously, like Shana said, I'm so gaslit by these officials at this point that I'm like, oh, they're fine. Like nothing really that bad happened. But I don't know about the goaltender interference at the end. I saw some prominent former goalies in the NHL saying that, yeah, this is goaltender interference. I guess you could see it move Freddie Stick a little bit. But I don't, I will never claim to know what this rule is. So we need to fix the rule because that can't happen. That scenario can't happen and can't decide or not decide an entire series. Not that it did though, because then you go back to the hurricanes couldn't score. That's what decided the series to me. So Shana, you already remarked on this, but I want to get your thoughts. And I think you've, you've hinted at them, but just let's flush this out. Obviously, Florida has the great celebration. The rats come down and they go ahead and touch the Prince of Wales trophy. Uh, It's lore. It's, you know, what's it called? Superstition. But it doesn't really seem to impact. I think it was our friend Sean Shapiro who reported that I think he said the last four Stanley Cup winners have touched 
the conference trophy. I, if I've got that wrong, Sean, I apologize. But did you love it or did you hate it? Are we here for it or do we want it to go away? Um, I, you know what? I do think there's like a funny moment, the drama of will they or won't they touch? Like, I'm watching this with my friends this time. They're like, oh, is he going to touch it? And and Rich is like, Kachuk is touching it. Kachuk is touching it. He's like, there's no fucking way he doesn't. And I do think it's funny to have like your 30 seconds of wondering and I, but I loved it. I loved how they were like, fuck your superstitions because every superstition probably said they shouldn't be here. And I think that they played it a little bit more like we had the president's trophy last year and we didn't touch it. And they're like this year, they're like, fuck it. We, you just win a trophy. I'm sorry. I understand there's a superstitious element to it. And I respect that as someone who has a ton of their own. But when you get this trophy and you're supposed to embrace this moment and you're standing there like, we can't touch it. Nobody, nobody, nobody prays on it. I honestly hate that. So I'm glad we're getting it out there that champions now are actually doing this and actually appreciating their moment. Like we're the most boring sport in the world <laughs> here. And everybody is so stiff and doesn't want to have a good time that we have to say you can't touch it. If you touch the goddamn trophy, have a great time, lift it over your head, pick it up, walk to the locker room like Barkoff did. Like that was such <laughs> the yes. energy he had. It was like, uh, we just fucking went like, we're, go celebrate. This is when let the Bud Lights roll because you're going to have a long layoff regardless. Like go enjoy yourself. This is when you actually celebrate. Mm -hmm. They earned it. it. As, they, yeah. as they keep saying, they earned it. And I loved Matt Kachuk's face lighting up yesterday during the interviews where he was just like, and we'll do it again in the Stanley Cup final. Whoa, that's so cool to say. He was just realizing for the first time, it's like we're going to Disney World. They didn't win yet, but- it's just somewhere he's never been before. And he, I, you could just tell he was taking it all in. I think, I I mean, I love the guy. I love his chirps and I love the enthusiasm, but I also think he's a pretty thoughtful person. Like just hearing him talk in interviews is really making me excited about the future of a league with a star like him in it. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, we will, uh, I'm sure, start to dig in more to this whole idea of, Florida's regular season versus Florida's postseason, um, but they are headed to the Stanley Cup final. Congratulations to them. Well earned. I do think it was a tight series. I do agree with Rod Brindamore. If you watch those games, if you looked at the underlying play, Carolina doesn't have anything to hang their head on in terms of what they executed, but it is a four game sweep. Florida advances. Congrats to them. There I was wish it was longer. It was so, the games were so good after round two that I was like, all right, if we get five or six games, I'm thrilled. I think the drama of it's more fun than it was a sweep, but I like, I think that was one of the few series we could look at and be like, just keep going. Cause how many times are like, just ended? This sucks. Well, speaking I of know. that, let's go to the West. Um, because the <laughs> Vegas wow. has transition of the year. <laughs> Speaking of that, Vegas has now gone up 3-0 over Dallas. And this was a series I was very much hoping for a great series, a long series. I was expecting this to be a good battle. Vegas had already put a two game lead on this series. And then in game three, an egregiously bad hit by Jamie Ben on Mark Stone takes him out of the game and has now since earned him a two game suspension that yes, friends will in fact carry over to next year's regular season if they cannot extend their postseason, which seems unlikely because of the fact that Jamie Ben is not there. They have not been able to play well. And more importantly, Jake Ottinger seems to be broken. Stay tuned for Did the Kraken Break Jake Ottinger, my column. But here we are with Vegas having a chance to close out this series in a sweep tonight being Thursday as we record this. Not only was it embarrassing in terms of that hit, in my opinion, but then the Stars fans, as the game starts to get out of control, Max Domi taking egregious penalties, it's just continued to get out of control. Stars fans start to throw shit on the ice. They actually have to stop the second period a little bit early to just end play, regroup, and come back and add those seconds on to the start of the third. Jamie Ben, who, reminder, is captain of the Dallas Stars by his choice, did not speak to the media after that game, which I find irresponsible. Uh, now I just want this one to end. Sarah, how disappointed are we in the Dallas Stars, not just in game three, but across the series as a whole? First of all, I hate them for so many reasons. And number one is making me root for the Vegas Golden Knights. Like, are you <laughs> kidding me? Why am I like, this team has good vibes? Oh, because they're playing the worst vibes in the world. And 
please give me credit. I have said this from the start. And I'm like, yeah, Joe Pavelski, love that storyline. But it's just, they aren't playing the brand of hockey that I love to see. And you could tell that fine. the games were close in the first two games, but they still didn't find a way. And then you could obviously tell frustrations caught up to them in game three. And then everything just finally, I was waiting for that shoe to drop or that cross check to somebody's neck to hit. And oh my God, they imploded. Do you guys think that the two game suspension is fair? I I honestly was shocked because I, you know, usually, again, we don't necessarily know how the rules are written. Usually if you get a gamer and, and it came so early in the game, usually the unofficial back of the envelope math means that that counts as a game. And then, you know, each playoff game counts as two regular season games. So because he missed so much of game three, I was expecting one. But I was not going to argue with two because there are other cases earlier in these playoffs where I thought there should have been two games and there was only one. Shayna, did you like it or not like it? Um, well, I hated the play. Yeah. I hated that's your captain. That's yeah. your captain taking himself out, putting you at a disadvantage. The game fell apart from that moment on. You could have tried to weather the storm of that early goal. They couldn't do it. Um I thought too that he got the game. I was not going to be surprised if there was no suspension, which I didn't mm. agree with. But I'm like, well, Mark Stone's healthy from like he didn't he get finish the game. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. So that they and he's available for the next game. That I was like, okay, he technically got a game because it happened so early. I don't expect anything. Plus, there's no recent suspension history for this. But then I was thinking about it. I'm like, he literally ended. Yes, it was two years ago, but Dylan Larkin's season. Yep. With a cross check to the neck that sent him to the hospital. And that kept buzzing through my head. And then the second he spoke, which was before the hearing, if I remember right, um, he was like, oh, I, he, I, you know, like he felt the zero remorse was like, that's the nail in the coffin. I think of if you can tell Department of Player Safety why you screwed up, why you understand, you're going to get a lighter, you know, punishment a lot of the time. But in this case, the absolute lack of care, which from a fourth line player who gives a shit, the captain of all people who's done this before, I'm like, you know what? Give him two fucking games. It doesn't even matter about the two games because guess what? You're not getting that far at this point. Like if you have, thanks to you, you're, you have an even lesser shot of it. Yeah. And I mean, the, the narrative we were talking about, this is not lost on us that this is another game where a game misconduct gets called. Pete DeBoer is on one of the benches. Joe Pavelski is in the game. Now he's not the player getting hit this time, but Vegas is on the other side too. If you think about it, this is a, a bit of karma coming back um, against a lot of people involved in this game. But Sarah, I want to ask you too, and I was joking, but kind of not, um, Jake Ottinger has not been himself. He has not been himself in round two either. And, you know, people started talking about, is he broken? Is something going on? And, and I thought to two things. I thought, first of all, how the narrative became in that round two with the Kraken, that the Kraken had figured out that there was a weakness that was able to be exploited high blocker side for Jake Ottinger. And anytime I think a player knows about something that's being exposed, they may start to overcorrect or at least be overly aware of that. And secondly, I thought back to also, it was late in the season, it was March, and, and I was hyper-focused on the Stars because the Kraken played them three times in seven days. But that's when Jake Ottinger was playing a shit ton of hockey because he was their only option, he was their best option. And the media was asking Pete DeBoer about overplaying Ottinger then, and he was like, we have to because we have to get we have to get into the playoffs and solidify our spot in the postseason. So now I ask you, Sarah, is Jake Ottinger broken, tired, or both? What do we think about the goaltending in Dallas's net? I think he's just a baby. I think he's just a little guy. And he. this is a tough playoffs, especially for him right now, especially with the team kind of around him and not the best performances out of some of the Dallas Stars stars and he's one of them that isn't having the best performance but I think it's just like a, another experience for him on the way to becoming a great goaltender that I think he's going to be I do think the Kraken kind of broke him with their depth right because you don't know where they're coming from or when you can't take a breath where maybe he had been in situations prior where it's like, okay, I can take a breather with these guys on the ice or something, but that just like wasn't the case. But that is an important learning lesson for him. Dana Ottinger, broken, tired, both, neither. Both. 
Um, I think that playing a lot of games at the, down the stretch probably hurt. I think that he's never played this type of workload before. And we see, I think he's young. He's someone that should handle it is absolutely true versus someone like maybe Markstrom, who at 30 years old is playing 80% of the games is going to break the next year. You totally expect that. But I think the thing for him is it's getting it into that adjustment period. I think this is the year we're going to see it weigh on him. And I think this is going to help him moving forward. I think we saw it similarly with like Shesterkin last year when he went into the postseason at first, he started to struggle because it was like, wait a second, I've never played this much hockey before. This pace, this environment, this everything on top of it. I, I think it's if he was struggling in round one, bounce back in round two, maybe it's a different conversation, but he was great in round one. We really, I think it's, and out of his last 11 games are not quality starts. I think we're up to now. So I I think his confidence is shot from this. Obviously it seems that way because he's misplayed like the, the game winner in game one, like he misplayed the puck. I don't think that happens if he has the confidence a little bit more, but I just think that it's, it's a combination of everything right now. I hope for his sake, because we all love him and we want to see him do well, you know, this young goalie that can be a franchise goalie. Like, I hope that this is the building block for him to understand the long playoff runs, what it takes and everything like that. And he's prepared for it. I don't think this is going to hurt him next year. I think it's going to help him. So we'll see what happens uh, tonight uh, in game four. We'll see if we're still talking about round three the next time we join with you all, or if we are moving on to the Stanley cup final, but for now, my friends, it is time for our very favorite game to end the episode. And that is fuck, Mary kill. Before we go into fuck, Mary kill, I do want to quickly acknowledge we had some people voice back to us and we perhaps did not do our best work. Um, we all dismissed Alex Stalock um, in our fuck, Mary kill of the Masterton Award. And I did want to acknowledge that this is a player who went through quite a bit, came back to the NHL after being diagnosed with myocarditis, which is an inflammation of the heart. He dealt with COVID and he did have a very successful season, irregardless of what was happening in Chicago. So we do apologize that it felt like we didn't do our best prep knowing the full story behind his nomination. Kudos to him for what he did. But we're jumping the order. We're going through awards and we feel compelled that for Fuck, Mary Kill, we have to talk about the GM of the Year Awards. We're going to get to the actual game here in a second. But as I started to think about this more and more and some of the discourse that was going on here, why the hell are we waiting to vote on this till the end of the second round of the playoffs? So if that's what we're going to do, why don't we just acknowledge that it's pretty much going to go probably to three of the four GMs whose teams are still playing. Like, I don't get it. I propose, why not do multiple votes and see who comes out? Look at the trade deadline, look at all-star break and look at end of regular season. I'm pissed about the timing of this. So before we get to fuck Mary kill and the actual nominees, Sarah, is the way this award is voted, specifically the timing of it, fucked up? I say fuck it all. Let's have the goalies vote on GM of the year. <laughs> I love it. The GMs get to vote on the Vesna. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Shayna, what do you think about the timing of this? Like, I just, and, and look, we love you, Florida friends. But honestly, if this was voted on at the end of the regular season, there's no fucking way Bill Zito's in the conversation. <laughs> Respect None. None. There's literally zero way for the team that snuck in because the team lost not have the team that we all at the deadline if they lost we're all sitting there going why couldn't you do anything at the deadline oh wait because you fucked yourself last year and not to say that going all in last year was bad but like you put yourself in this situation it's a consequence of what you did and it's not the first time he has been in that situation he was assistant GM in Columbus with the same type of thing so maybe he should have been more prepared for it like the timing is so mind-boggling because of course we're going to be biased based on results i'm not even faulting the voters for it at this point while i disagree with it and think yeah i think we're kinds of people who could be like yeah it's more than just results and we would look at everything i understand people who look at it and go but your team is here versus a team that maybe had an incredible year and or an incredible deadline or was super smart and then got their asses kicked in round one it's just not right. If we're, why is it that every other award gets voted on earlier than to ensure it's a regular season award? Even if you feel right. like you have to do it after round one, it's like a different conversation than after round two. The yeah, final four teams are who we're all talking about. It's, it's, it makes no sense. Or maybe do it once after round one and then once, yeah. uh, once before round one and then once after and then average the results. Like, I don't even know. Like, it just makes legitimately no sense to me because we know how the results are going to go. Lula yeah. Morello won this award. It was pointed out to me and I completely forgot 
twice in the last couple of years because the Islanders went to the Eastern Conference final. Meanwhile, all Lou Lamarello did to that point was hire Barry Trotz, who brought in his entire staff and make weird trades to bring back players he's he, he knows, his friends and people he's had before. And we're like, here, Lou, take an award. While we're all sitting here going like, get out of the league at this point. You're not good at your job. I just, it it's, it's what an weird, award. It's a weird bias for sure. So uh, we, we challenge, we've, we, we have filed our official challenge on the timing of this, because as you're, as you're saying, Shane, if this is a regular season award, there are many candidates that I would suggest should be considered, not just these three, but let's you get into name one or two. Well, we don't have time today, so okay. let's get into fuck, Mary kill here. Uh, Sarah, as is tradition, you are up first. And I'm sure you're going to have some spicy takes that we've already talked about that I'm sure are going to come out here again. Fuck, Mary Kill, GM of the year. Dallas is Jim Nill. Florida's Bill Zito. Boston's Don Sweeney. Take it away, Sarah. I'm sorry. I don't think Don Sweeney should be a qual- like even in under consideration because of the Mitchell Miller stuff and because of the way it was handled. You could just tell from top to bottom there was miscommunication. His players revolted. Yeah, he literally, there was a mutiny. So I don't think that he is the GM of the year. I'm going to kill him. I am going to marry, oh God, it's Bill Zito and who else? A Jim Nail. Jim Nail. My last brain cell is dying. I'm going to kill, oh, okay, I already killed, oh my God. You can, kill, very, you, know what? you can kill multiple if you want. I was up very late last night. I'm going to marry Bill Zito. I'm sorry, guys. That's fine. Because I think the Kachuk, I mean, it's just so hindsight, but the Kachuk move was the perfect move, obviously. And it's literally all he had to do. And he inher- inherited what he inherited, which wasn't the best from Dale Talon. So I don't, I don't know. There's not like, there's slim pickings this year, I guess. And I'll fuck Jim Neal. Good for you. I don't know. All right, Shayna, your turn. I'm going to kill Don Sweeney. Yes. Did he make great moves and do a lot? Absolutely. Does not fucking matter. You're pl- like you said, your players revolted against you. Sorry. You're out. Nope. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to fuck Bill Zito because on the one hand, I think he inherited a shitty situation and like Bobrovsky's contract and all of that. And that's absolutely true from talent, but he also inherited a very good core and players like, Barkov and Ekblad like that helps the biggest thing he did was the Kachuk trade and not signing the Huberto extension I still question the whole Uyghur thing I think they'd be better with Uyghur but to not have that Huberto extension and to be willing to make such a ballsy move of Kachuk he deserves credit but I also think a smart waiver wire pickup of, uh, or something uh, very minimal at the deadline for an extra depth defenseman could have gone a long way because again this team almost didn't have this moment. And I think if he made a tweak besides knowing Duclair would be healthy, it would be a different conversation, right? Like they probably wouldn't have had to wait for teams to lose to get in. I will marry Jim Nil by process of elimination then, because I have the, I have less strong feelings about him than Zito. And I struggle yeah. giving Zito all the credit. Uh, I, I think his deadline was fine. I think the Danoff was a good ad. I liked it for Dallas. Um, the Pete DeBoer hire, and knowing to move on from Rick Bonus was a good move um, to know that they needed something different. Well, I'm not the biggest Pete DeBoer fan. He obviously has different results than Bonus. So I'm like, okay, sure. And some of like the contract extensions have been good. I like, you know, like the hints deal and stuff like that. So I'm like, okay, sure. And p- keeping Pavelski around. So. Okay. Sure. I am going to kill uh, Don Sweeney for the exact same reasons. I think it's absolutely abhorrent that he is being considered for a GM of the year after what he did in the state of upholding what hockey is supposed to be about. I'm going to fuck Bill Zito because I agree. I think that, you know, hindsight is 2020 and the problem is what we challenge GMs to do is to make moves and then look good in the moment too. Um, And I'm also going to fuck Bill Zito because I'm going to marry Jim Nil because the more I've looked into how this organization is being built, I think he's building it really smartly. I think he's using analytics in a really interesting way. And I think he's building it in intentional waves so that as certain levels of talent age out, he's got the young talent coming in under smart contracts, as you mentioned, Shana. So uh, that those are my choices. We will see what the voters pick in an obviously time-biased award, but here we are. All right, 
My friends, we thank you all so much. We congratulate the Florida Panthers and their fans for making it to the Stanley Cup final. What an exciting time. If you want to celebrate that with us, please follow us on the socials on Instagram and Twitter at two underscore much underscore man. You can interact with us there. You can send us your vibe checks. Don't forget, we want to see you celebrating wherever you are. And if you're doing it in a set of Too Many Men merch, you might get entered in a drawing for a prize. If you have no Too Many Men merch, go to too many men merch.com. How convenient is that? And buy anything your little heart desires. And until we meet again, we ask you to please do something no matter how big or small to make sure that hockey truly is for everyone. Talk to Love you soon. you. Bye. Love you. Oh, no, we're off. Oh, we're okay. We're okay. We're tired, but we're happy. Talk to you soon.